if you are new to Twitch, uh, you don't need to be signed in. If you are signed in to Twitch, then you can ask me quick questions in the chat. I will periodically check those messages and respond to you. Uh, if you don't like Twitch and you'd rather follow me on Twitter or get my Discord or what have you, um, you're welcome to do so also. Um, I'll just be less responsive on those other channels because it's quite hard to multitask as is when you're streaming. And uh, I can really only follow one, one set of questions. So I'm going to change what I'm currently bringing up on screen. And I wonder if I got this all right. Okay, so have I got that one's wrong, this one's right. Okay, here I have my web browser. So what we're going to do today is look for questions tagged Rust and Stack Overflow and <laughs> go to the top, like the, the highest, like the most requested questions and try to explain some of them in a way that works for you. My assumption is that the people who like the highest rated questions are the things that people are most having difficulty with and <laughs> so let's um and so are, are the most worthwhile to explain like how does that sound uh we don't necessarily need to go from sort of top to bottom but uh but that's an option as well so um if you'd rather if you've got a specific question that you'd like me to answer just just kind of like like hit me with it <laughs> And we'll see where I get to. I um I haven't really done this kind of well, actually no I ha I've done the kind of on the fly thing, but I'm really going to be testing myself uh with this because I w will flap in in times like I uh I don't have every <laughs> I don't have any uh like I've got no special powers like I don't know everything about there is to know about Rust, so. Now, <laughs> just in terms of that giggle water, like, I just laugh when I stream. I don't know why. I, I'm i not so giggly when I am, like, in, talking to you in real life, but I think just when I'm online, uh, I just really enjoy the presence of, like, kind of this kind of shared community space. Um, so... This is a really interesting question because it was one of the ones that got me as well, like right at the start of, of, of my journey with Rust. And like, the first question that comes up is like, what is the difference between string and stir? <laughs> and sadly, for a beginner, the like very first answer that is correct and has been upvoted hundreds of times, like hundreds and hundreds, 600, talks about is a dynamic heap string type like vec like and the reason why this is frustrating to me is like if i have only done python what the heck is a dynamic heap string type like vec <laughs> that doesn't mean anything to me so uh but and i want to kind of explain what that means um let's have a go at kind of doing this literally um this example as well is sort of super technical because you kind of need to know what is happening in underneath like this is, like this is a good answer it's technically correct but i don't know if it's a it's an answer that's suitable for beginners or at least that's my assumption so i'm going to try and, and flesh this out so like the first of all one of the troubles with so from python if i was to there's like no distinction between item like this is a perfectly legitimate variable in python but in in rust you actually don't have a string literal that means the string with a capital s type this is kind of like i'm i'm just going to ask you to park that problem for right now <laughs> because uh i'll explain why that is but at the, for the moment uh, I just I just need you to kind of bear with me. So we can't actually create a string literal. Sorry, we can't create a string with capital S with it, like a literal syntax. Uh, what we create is this stir type, and so we're uh, we're starting with uh, we're starting with hey Tim, and that's a stir, and we're converting it into a string with a capital S, and that's not green, that's greeting. 
I just need to learn to type also. And we can do some, you know, really interesting things with strings, like we can print them out. And uh, so that's cool. So we, we'll execute this. Could you move your video to the bottom right? Yes, I definitely can. My, oh yeah, of course, it's like clobbering up the thing. No, that's absolutely fine. Excuse me for that. Um, I'm just going to do so. Wait. There we go. Done. Thanks for that. Sorry. <laughs> hey, Pippo. How are you going? <laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, now. So hopefully I'm not going to clobber up my code. That's absolutely fine. Now. So I've got, there's my, there's my, there's my output down the bottom here. And that's fine. So that's capital, that's capital S string. Now I've got this other problem. It's like, okay, so how is that different from, from this? Like, it's exactly the same. Like, <laughs> ostensibly, there are two types, and it's just completely doubled up. Like, what is the point in there being two? Uh, it turns out that the way that computers work requires us to be very specific. And the way, the way that computers work and the way that Rust likes to work is Rust wants to align itself, like, as a programming language with very close to the way that computers work. And the way that computers work is um, weird. And so these mean different things. The string literal during the execution phase starts as like the compiler goes and says, oh, look, this is a thing that will, uh, is kind of fixed. So I can like throw it into a section of the binary just as it is. It turns out though that a string with a capital N, so that's a what this thing here is like a static stir static is like a particular part so over on the left here in static storage so what is static storage static storage is actually a part of the memory address that's outside of the stack and the heap it turns out but um it uh it kind of lives in its own little space of memory that will never change but it's available for the entire lifetime of the end of the whole program so anything with the lifetime and this syntax with the with the uh, prefix with um, the apostrophe is, or sort of single quote, is uh, the lifetime annotation. So it's saying, like, if you're in the static, you, like, you exist for the entire life of the program. And that's cool. Uh, a string, on the other hand, does not exist right at the start. So you could imagine that... Um, and this, this comes into play when we have multiple multiple functions but in the, uh, might have just mucked my explanation up but if i take a the the problem is it becomes a lot trickier to pass memory or pass a reference oh, no, that's a bad way to explain it What's happening during the string, capital S, is that the program at runtime is asking the operating system for enough memory to fit in this string. So the full type of this one here is ampersand static stir. So that means a reference to a string, which is it just happens to be a UTF, a, a section of memory that's guaranteed to be guaranteed to be utf8 encoded with the lifetime of static and uh it has this content now if we were to say that i think that's the, that should be that should compile that's exactly the same we're just being very oh unused variable oh we've got this sort of silly function that doesn't exist um now if i try and print Am I making sense, by the way? It's a, it's a useful question to ask. I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit, but hopefully not too badly. The, 
big distinction is that in the computer cares about where the memory is and rust what tries to do what the compute like very very close to the memory management model of the actual computer <laughs> can you do like emoji length that's a super interesting question um the answer is you can but actually no the answer is it's complicated <laughs> i will uh i'll just try what i'll just try and demonstrate that it's actually a lot simpler to pass around a string than it is to pass around a stir well actually maybe that's not even the right way to explain it maybe So my name's Tim. If I greet myself, <laughs> I should greet someone else. <laughs> that specific emoji. Oh god, is there some like secret trick? Okay, so I can print out hey Tim to myself, that's great. Uh now the but notice it's got an ampersand at the front. It means I require a reference. Um, if I just ask for a stir, it's going to blow up at me because it turns out that the compiler doesn't actually know the length of a stir. It's kind of like a more basic type. It knows the length of a reference. And so when we want to use them as arguments, I find that using a string is kind of less mental overhead. The one way. So we, we can just kind of give string in, like just fine. I've just realized that I haven't, I've got one thing that's very, very important that, um, that I didn't mention earlier. And one of the kind of differences from like a cognitive level is that a stir, little s, uh, is owned by kind of like, when we see it, it exists in kind of static memory, what, and it has the, the static lifetime, it exists over the whole lifetime of the, pro, the, the uh, exists over the whole lifetime of the program. Now, that's important because that means no function or no scope needs to call like a destructor or like free the memory. Whereas in the case of a string, the memory is cleaned up once, in our case, this greet function is closed. So at this point here on line three, you can imagine like there's a, a hidden, we can even just insert it there. We could do it ourselves. Like, you can imagine that it's kind of like a hidden function and in Rustland, we call we okay that it's drop name. So this kind of gets magically, in, oh, that's saving doesn't work. This magically gets inserted at the end of the scope where um, variables that are owned by, in our case, main, main passes ownership, it starts as the owner, and then it passes ownership into greet, and then the memory is freed. But why an ampersand for stir but not string? Okay, that's a really, really useful question. I'm going to answer that right away. Uh, so one of the things that's really important for um, us here is that when I that memory can be managed by its owner, the responsibilities of an owner, which is like a scope, in Rust are to call the destructor of any of its owned things at the end of its little life cycle. Um, now the question is like, why did we not require an ampersand for string? Turns out you may occasionally see the syntax where you ask for a reference to a string. Just so that we're clear, that can occasionally happen as well. Um, now we get another compiler warning about memory not being used. And this happens when the greet function does not want to call the destructor. So in this case, the, the, the name variable will be 
available for a second time. So we'll call this thing twice. So the reference basically tells greet that is it, it, it's allowed read access to the variable name or in the memory, but actually ownership retains uh, stays with main. So if we bring back use sysmem, the mem dot uh, the mem drop function is called here. Now, uh, why is that a problem? Use of undeclared module unresolved input. Oh, uh, it's not sys. Um, it's in standard. Sorry. <laughs> I've been coding in Python for a little bit, and so um, I you get confused. Okay, right. Now, allow me to kind of change the game a little bit and take away the ampersand again. So now remember that this drop function is inserted by the compiler at the end of greet scope. So this kind of change, this makes it really obvious what's happening. And like, probably you don't need me to explain that the compiler is going to get very upset. And it's saying that we, we get this kind of complex answer, a complex question about greet name and um, <laughs> this move thing. Now move doesn't like physically mean that it got up in a truck <laughs> and kind of moved away. What it means is that like, the compi from the comp compiler's perspective, it has given ownership to greet, this greet scope. And the greet is responsible for freeing the memory. It does it implicitly because uh, um, we, doesn't, we don't need to add the, like, a free call uh, at the end of each thing's life cycle. But... Um, uh, but we it's a it becomes illegal to call it twice. So if we want to uh, retain the the mem uh, we want to retain the access to name, we have to use a reference, which is in some ways I like to think of it as like a read only uh, read only access to the thing. In our case, uh, string. Now there was a question earlier of why do we always require an ampersand to stir, like little case stir. By the way, if you've just joined me, what we're trying to do today is go through the highest voted questions on Stack Overflow and explain them in quite a lot of depth. Basically, until we finish all the questions, <laughs> and then we go on to the next one. Until like, unless I decide, like, actually, I don't know the answer myself, so I'll just skip. Uh, and the question that we're working through at the moment is, what are the differences between Rust string type and its stir type? So capital S string and little s string. And just kind of reflecting on the fact that the first answer is like accurate, but also really impenetrable for a beginner. And we're trying to kind of like work through all of Rust. The, the, why this question is really difficult is because to understand the answer, you need to know a lot about Rust. It's actually one of the most painful parts. Um, like once you've understand this distinction, you've basically learned Rust. <laughs> so, like, uh, so, right, let's carry on. Now, there was a question of like, the question that I was trying to answer is like, why do we always require an ampersand when we're dealing, when we're dealing with stirs? If we, uh, if we listen to the compiler, the compiler will tell me something around uh, life. Oh, actually this will work fine. I think unused doc comment. Oh, right. So it's saying that actually there's no need for you to to comment this out and i'm like well thanks compiler but actually i'm trying to do a demo here so i really prefer it <laughs> you just let me go um okay so thanks compiler that's useful um hey tim hey tim great 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 vs code highlights errors before running the other oh yeah so people in the chat are talking about a uh lsp language server protocol yes def rust definitely has one uh in fact it has two um i'll just kind of segue into that just because it's relevant. So there's this one project that's called Rust Analyzer. So this is kind of uh, the newer, flasher and more interesting. Um, I say more interesting. It is really good. <laughs> and then there's uh, the older, more established and official um, one that you get, which is um, Rust LSP. I'm sure that you can find it yourself. 
but I'm going to pass right now and then stick to stick, stick to strings. Um, so what's the most natural way to create a variable with just a string? Okay, that's a good question. I'll park the actually I'll get that I'll get I'll finish this answer and then I will get back to that one. So um uh, actually that's a really easy one to ask answer. So the when you're starting out with Rust, I would always do this. I would always use a string. And if you want if you get into issues with ownership like we've just we're just creating right now because I want to use the same this this variable here twice you just add a reference so this is an indication to Rust that you just want read only access it turns out that we can also ask for read write access as well uh, but we're not going to bother with that right now so if you're beginning with Rust I would stick with strings basically uh, as you become more competent with Rust and more familiar with its memory model, you can sort of say, you get to stuff like saying, I want to be able to accept a string or a stir. Now, uh, would I, uh, I can do that. In fact, there's a chat, there's actually a section in my book which is, explains this. Um, yeah. In fact, yeah, so I don't want to pump the book. Um, too much, but I know that I've already answered this question, so I want to. Oh, come on, work. Oh, I'm not logged in, so it, it doesn't it doesn't give me access. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, right, right. Um, so read write access is like this mutt annotation, <laughs> which is shorthand for mutable. And come on. Search for as ref. This will work at some stage. Okay. Come on. Thinking, 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 going down. Okay, what happens if you want to be able to ask for either a uh, a string or... So you've got a function and you want to enable it to be called by either a string or a, uh, a stir. Well, it turns out that we can ask Rust to use its generics and say for any type T or in the, uh, I can ask for anything that implements as ref into string. So this is, if you call, if you, if it, uh, if it implements this trait, if it implements as ref into str, you can, Either call it with a, a string or a, a stir. So this is kind of like a little magic hint that I found and think is really, really useful and handy. And what happens at a runtime is we, we say, we just ask for the reference. And it turns out that inside a string, capital T, there is like a, there is a a stir it turns out there's like another array of bytes that is utf8 encoded and this as ref call actually just asks for the reference to that array of bytes it turns out that that strings have just a couple of extra pieces of functionality they know their length and they are able to be owned by a specific um uh by a specific well, it's not block it's uh, scope which means that you have a little bit more control and um this they, they provide some extra functionality and they also implement more are they similar yes they are they are effectively um you could think of string as kind of being 
you it uh is it's kind of like a, a wrapper around little case s uh like stir so you could think of string as kind of like the, uh, the kind of like a a type that that has more functionality it imp it imposes a tiny like a literally minuscule probably negligible runtime overhead because there's sometimes an, an added indirection especially if you have a reference to a string but uh but effectively string just provides a little bit more um functionality to you it implements a little bit more and you get a little bit more freedom with what you do with the memory so there was one other question that i was really quite what about into string oh right so we can also so the other question in the chat was like well what if we ask for any type that can convert itself into a string this is another way to do it i don't know if a stir knows how to convert itself into a string it turns out that it can so how do we figure out like what the heck's going on there by the way so we go to the standard libraries documentation and i look up so i it, just this is a question in case you're reading any of our source code you're like what the heck is that function syntax this says for any given t that is restricted to things that implement this particular trait which is an interface and in this particular it's <laughs> yeah, it's a trait that is parameterized by a string so it's saying if you can convert yourself into a string the euro you're okay to um, work here i want to find out like what the heck this means so i can look into the standard libraries documentation and say that um there is blah, 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 blah. what what can i do um and like i can look into the trait it turns out that into and from is like a, a, an especially difficult one for beginners to figure out because there's actually even more generic code on the inside it turns out that everything that implements into also implements from and like sometimes you don't know which was going which and they get all these wrapper types and it's like what the heck is going on <laughs> so um, another way to do it is to look for the concrete type and say so, well okay uh so you're saying i'm thinking about looking into so you can see kind of just going to get this just that maybe it's something to do with conversion so that's cool so you're like well i want to call it with a stir primitive type which is called a string slice more um what does it implement so another way is kind of like saying like what does it what can it actually provide and we get this thing like uh, this kind of notion of an implementation and right down the bottom of the docs is so there's like it implements a lot so there's like quite a lot of methods and down here we get we should have either from or into oh gosh there's two string now that's actually a different trait <laughs> goodness me it becomes ridiculously complicated uh, because it turns out that strings are special cased and Ah oh, well, this is this is quite complicated. This becomes really really difficult to explain. I've like gone like seven levels deep. But what the heck is the two string type, and why is that not the into string type? Like straight. I'm mixing up type and trait. Uh, okay, so two string type is a trait is got one method, which is two string, and. It is used by the display trait, which is this special print line syntax, for being able to represent itself as a string. Like an, any given type is able to um, convert itself. But by the way, we do see that stir implements it. And I am sure, I say sure. I'm looking for into, I'm just searching wildly. Mm. I'm gonna to have to dig into that, but basically, we follow up. Is there a right way time to use as ref or to into, or is it come down to personal preference? Maybe there are some types that can be represented with as ref and not into and the other way around. 
Uh, I use as reference because I know that it's going to be a, like a light conversion. What you're asking for is a is a reference, <laughs> which is fine because um, because you you know that it like if you need to like so what i what i've said is that i want to be able to accept any type that has as ref stir and the suggestion is well why aren't you using into string let me think about it from the point of view of uh the caller so i'm in main and i'm like i've got a string now into string that does nothing but over here in, in line 12 i've got a little s stir like a string slice. I now need the, the code, this into call now needs to dynamically allocate, it needs to create a string type, which it then feeds just to display. Whereas the other way around, so you're kind of growing it, growing the type. Whereas as ref, stir says, okay, on the string type, all I need to do is take out the reference to the internal stir, like internal array of bytes or, or the internal slice and pass that to greet. So that's basically free. And in the second call, I've already got a reference. It turns out that the string literal is actually typed as a reference to stir. It's already, so there's no difference. So you see, like there's, there's no penalty there. So uh, that's, that's my, my explanation. Now, Cool. I apologize that this question, again, I should explain like once more for if you just started with, with, with um, following the thread, uh, following the string. What are the difference between Rust string and stir is actually like once you learn it, you have understood Rust. And I mean that in a quite a fundamental way because it requires you to have understood borrowing. You need to know memory management and so forth. And uh, you do get, you do, over time, you'll learn what it means by dynamic heap string type, like Vec. And these words no longer sound like a foreign language after some time. That isn't to say that you are required to learn, like, all of this complexity to start with. Uh, should we go on to a new question? <laughs> Oh, by the way, I've just realized that the title is completely wrong. I did change it before. This, um, I did change all the screen. Is it, does it say com creativity in computers, learning, making plotter art with Inkscape? Because <laughs> uh, that was not what I intended. Oh, well. I think I restarted my computer just before the stream. Oh, okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Teaching you Rust programming. That's great. Cool. Because that's, that's what I did intend. Whew. Okay, cool. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Okay, maybe a great display as well, just to <laughs> round off all the trick. <laughs> yeah, in our case, what we, the reason why we want to uh we can also parameterize t by display this is a really good suggestion from um tom cass and that is like, the reason what we're actually trying to do is just print out a greeting to the to the console and so display is all we need like it gets away from uh i wonder what oh display is not found oh that's because it isn't included in the implicit. Uh, so some traits, many of them are included automatically in everything that you use, but display is not. I'm curious, oh, yeah, that works fine too. That's really, that is, thinking about it now, like that is kind of like a very ergonomic way to do this. Like if, if you only want a thing because you want to display it, well then it makes sense to keep the intention of what you're implementing like quite close because it might be the future in future 
what you're actually trying to do is not just like the, the the requirements for display might change like they might diverge from uh what you're doing and yeah there's there's no like as ref here that's that's gone um yeah so i think that's a really solid um recommendation cool okay so the next question is why does print line work why doesn't print line work in rust's unit tests now i almost feel i'm curious as to uh i don't actually know if i can test inside the uh inside the playground i'm trying to do things inside the playground because it kind of is the l um lowest barrier to entry and ah i can i can test so there are no tests here so <laughs> it's not going to um it's not going to do much <laughs> okay so let me start by explain well actually maybe i don't need to explain but yes i probably do so to annotate if any like to call something a unit test in rust is to give it this test annotation now we can we don't need to prefix it with test test console like this is not necessary but you know by convention we could do so we can just call the console function a uh a test function just by by virtue of the fact that it, we've included this test annotation now the question is like why on earth huh where is this and i'm just going to assert that true exists i don't i've got a test there warning dead code functions never used okay well i might just remove that then uh, i'm just going to allow unused oh actually uh, no we'll keep it simple we'll keep we'll keep so we're just testing things now and da -da -da -da, working through the playground is thinking and oh it's not a function it's a macro so this test should pass right like we we all agree that true <laughs> okay cool uh so i think that the the original question was like where is the where's it gone <laughs> like i cannot see the output here it's hidden <laughs> uh now what happens if i like i assert something that to be true which is actually false i kind of get more there's the console output there it is so this is an attempt this is like a quite an easy question to answer really uh when your tests succeed they hide your output like <laughs> we can also i don't think that we're able to prov like specify other flags it turns out that you can specify other flags to the in particular is no capture um that's easy okay great <laughs> any questions there from the audience five four three two one no <laughs> yay the first question took me 40 minutes the second question took me less than a minute so that's great oh boy this one is tricky oh gosh i was talking like i referenced a tweet someone actually referenced the tweet at the start of the, the stream saying oh look i came to your <laughs> i came to your stream because you tweeted out about how it is really easy to it should be really easy to learn rust um I, I, this thing kind of blew up on me a little bit and here's the tweet intimidated to learn rust because it's a systems programming language um the problem is with me not you uh <laughs> like because i'm a teacher so i should actually you know i need to bear the burden of this and you don't because <laughs> you're the learner it should be we should we want to make things as simple as possible for you <laughs> and this question is going to prove me wrong <laughs> because 
I've got to deal with like assembly and I don't want to. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, uh, so I'm I'm I did spend 40 minutes discussing strings. <laughs> <laughs> the different strain string is to I um <laughs> now I'm going to try my best to explain a particular topic that matters to people that care a lot about this kind of stuff that matters almost nothing to me. <laughs> okay, so first of all <laughs> Why does the Rust compiler not optimize code, assuming that two mutable references cannot alias? And then it gives us explain is this kind of example from C code, which, and this is C syntax over on the left here. Um, I'll just remove that because it's no longer relevant. As far as I did it, we get this thing about ads and like, when compiled, we get this kind of O3, we kind of get this like, emits this kind of like wonderful assembler. And that's cool, but um, and we know we can say that like they'll never alias. So what this means is that you're get telling the compiler that you guarantee that they will never refer to the same memory address. So this is what it means by an alias. It means that A and B, which are both pointers, which means that they're numbers representing some place in memory, they will never be the same number. And you notice that this the question is answering saying look the output is different and then there's a question of like aha but with rust i add these kind of funny things here i get an output that looks a lot like the first one but rust knows that it will be the second it turns out that actually why will rust know Uh, okay. And the thing is, by definition, mutable references, which is kind of like read write access, it turns out that they are both pointers as well, which is both numbers that represent locations in memory, can never refer to the same memory address. So, by definition, under like Rust's language, like, like the output of our compiler. The Rust compiler should look like this more optimized version of the binary code. It turns out that if you know any of assembler and you don't need to know it, but in case you do, we you know we load up these addresses in memory, we add them together, and then we pop off the queue. Like that's three instructions, and could probably um, like we could do billions of these a second. Uh, whereas this other one, we kind of like we kind of need to kind of do a bunch more loading and stuff because the fact that is we need to double check that we might need two copies of the same data um and it basically turns that llvm which is our the kind of like backing compiler like was not good enough <laughs> and well or at least like for some problem there were compiler bugs and they don't want compiler bugs so until that's fixed it um it will stay like that like so that's basically it <laughs> did that does this is this a question that means anything to anybody that's following along if not i'm going to carry i'm going to go to the next question uh, if it is something you would like me to explore further or interest, is this at all interesting? I'm going to kind of like pause there for a few seconds and, um, ticking, tick tock, tick tock, tock. I've, I've got no one screaming at me saying that you must explain this in more depth. <laughs> so I'm going to say that is not interesting to you. <laughs> uh, it's not interesting to me. So I'm going to carry on. Uh, how to disable unused code warnings in Rust? Ah, this is someone that, that, that this means a lot to me. We actually encountered this just before. Um, so here is here's the
Here's the original. Um, well, it's kind of like here's here's some code that will trigger the unused warning. <laughs> so this is it's 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 basically saying, look, buddy, uh, you've created some source code that means nothing. It's never going to be accessed. It turns out actually though that the compiler in many cases is wrong about this. Uh, if you create a if you're doing some kind of weird crazy send, uh, systems programming work and I will pr try to provide an example um, you need this functionality um, because you're going to create a function that actually is called by the CPU outside of your own program flow um, and I talk explain a lot about this in, in, in my book um, so we kind of go into kind of like way too much depth <laughs> about signals, um, but along, are we going to go through, um, do, 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 um, somewhere along here, we have, um, this thing, allow dead code. So there is a legitimate use case for saying that our main function, or uh, there are functions that exist that do not require, that should be compiled, that um, that may be dead. And in this case, actually, it turns out as well. So does that make any sense? <laughs> I'm just trying to explain that sometimes it's not just you being lazy. There are legitimate reasons why your compiler should be instructed to compile code even though it doesn't exist in the control flow. Um, great. <laughs> so this is a, um, a, quite a, quite a fun question. Like how do I print the type of a variable? Uh, let's assume that I have the following variable, my number. Uh, Let's say that I have my number. I think this is not a great number, but whatever. 42, 42, just for fun. How do I print the type? If you merely wish to find out the type. Ah, that's a really good question. Okay, so the question has just popped up in the chat. Like, what on earth do you do if you just want to start? <laughs> like... Um, allow me to answer this one. I think that it's a so so the the first answer is really useful. Like if you just want to find out what the type of the variable is, you could do something that you know is wrong and the, the get the compiler to uh just tell you like <laughs> why you're wrong. Like it's like no. You're not a string. <laughs> I, oh, except found a float. So uh, the expected a struct string, but I found a floating point number to try to use a conversion method. So that's nice that it, it gives me a recommendation. If you really would like a string, then you could convert it. Um, we could add, so we could say like, um, oh, you're, you're an integer. And they will say, no, you're not an integer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's one way to do it like if you're just doing it for your own um, for your own benefit then you don't actually need to do anything now if you want to really print it out because for some reason you kind of like you might want to store something on the um on disk perhaps we can kind of use kind of like a secret well it's not even secret <laughs> it's like right there in public it's standard any type name uh we can that's a weird way to do it how fascinating 
Okay, so I'm just I'm very intrigued by by this. Um... Now, interestingly, so we we call this thing standard any type name of T. Now, interestingly enough, at least interesting to me, <laughs> is that we don't care about the variable because we never access the variable directly. What we access is the variable's type. So the value does not matter to us, so we don't worry about it. We're actually asking the system to provide the information of the type of the variable. So, so what is this syntax? Okay, an underscore is just a placeholder value. So the placeholder value is like, just I don't need to give, it's just an anonymous argument. It doesn't, but it must be of a reference to type t and they say well what on earth is could type t be and it's like well actually it's any type any type in the entire language if it's valid it works that doesn't make any sense to me <laughs> then you go down and say well it turns out that uh it doesn't need to make any sense to you it just needs to make sense to the rust compiler and the rust compiler wants to know what uh it is able to take that type information and call from the any type, which is actually every type. It's able to take the type name and print that out. I don't understand traits and generics. I apologize for introducing it. Now. Okay, so so that's that's something that I definitely need to answer. So, like, what is a generic type, and like, what is a trait? <laughs> <laughs> because uh but i've actually already got something on the stack so the question that i need to pop off the stack first <laughs> and i apologize for using computer terminology is do i have any tips for starting rust completely from scratch with absolutely no experience yes my 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 answer to that is to work through rust by example If you have used a programming language before, Rust by example is a series of uh, is a series of like very small, discrete example, like example pieces of code that can be run in the browser that gives you a sense of. Uh, like it tells you how to how to so we can push play and it get this thing running and it's like it comes out with hello world it turns out that and this works for the whole book so you don't need to download a compiler you don't need to download anything it turns out that it actually sends the code to the site that i have on the right which is the rust playground which is play rust dot org uh, rustlang dot org um, so that's where i would start now if you would like more information or more thorough information for other things, you are welcome to also send me messages um, and, or like ask me offline and I will try to compile something um, this weekend. I think I'll try and um, if you'd like and I can kind of provide like a guided tour <laughs> or at least how I would start. Um, now, by the way, you may ask you, well, like, didn't you write a book on Rust? Like, would, why is that not the first thing that you would learn? like use and i i and it's true i have written a book on rust the book that i have written is um is a uh is oh, that's not the right one it's a very very highly rated um textbook but it costs money <laughs> so i do not recommend that you spend money to start with um my recommendation is that you start with the free resources and if once you um, once you exhaust them and once you need more information then you pay money my um, so that's that's my recommendation so the question I now need to answer is I don't understand traits and generics okay we'll start with generics generics are ways for To start with generics and 
I thought manic, yeah, so, so that's live book, so manning.com. So there is a version online that um, you can access now. And I think you can get several chapters for free. And that's here um but it will eventually ask you to pay money <laughs> I think. so let me answer this question about generics so the is why well, i say one way to start with generics is to start about the alternative to generics which is say what go does and then like print type of like and this is bad because like and 32 and we take away the generics and we want this to be an i32 and turns out that we like this is going to get very repetitive very very soon and then we want to do f32 so we come along here and we create another function which can work by <laughs> And then it's like, oh, well, we've also got a floating point that is float 64. It turns out that uh, this is quite boring, quite fast. <laughs> and so a generic type is literally just one function. Like a generic type is used as a function uh, within a function to tell the compiler that it, could, it should do this work itself. So underneath, uh, underneath, the source code like once it gets compiled into the binary the compiler literally goes for every single type that is called it will go and create a specific function for every single one for every single type uh so the, you see the, i'll say like this is n and uh n is uh, float 32 bit and i will print out print type of and this i need to go like f32 like that will work and we'll get an f32 at the bottom oh no it's saying get us a dead code warnings uh but there it is there's f32 right there on the bottom now if we say <laughs> that there is an uh so generics just basically allow you to write less source code and push more work to the compiler that's all that's all that's there for now then the next question is what is a uh what's a trait like that's a fair question for if you're <laughs> asking for us like what on earth is a trait i don't understand why uh why are you asking me about this i don't get it and the answer to that question is a trait can be thought of basically as an abstract base class. If you have ever used an object-oriented programming language, whenever you have, whenever you see the word trait, and like replace, like delete that and replace it with abstract base class in your head, or an abstract class. But abstract base class is probably more accurate, and that will that will probably work. A trait is. Just the definition of functions. So we've got this miscellaneous trait and it like has one method. So this is, and I take a reference to self and I do nothing. Like that is good enough. In fact, I can use less. I don't even need a, a method. I can just have a trait with no methods, which is formally known as a marker trait, but um, Let's say I've got um, this miscellaneous thing. Now, if I have a type and I can implement so this uh, miscellaneous for F30, uh, I'm going to need my own one. So I'll need a. Don't think it's. Uh, struct, and um, I will just call it empty. 
for it. And I can implement empty by saying that, like, so I just record and copy the uh, function signature, and then I can do whatever I want in here because it. Mm, But, oh, that's actually not going to work. Now I can, so we, we're trying to answer the question of like, what on earth is a trait? And a trait, again, is just, an, is just a base class, an abstract class, uh, if you've used object-oriented language. Um, so here, empty is the, string literal syntax for constructing a given type and then it turns out that empty actually rep is represented outside of memory at all uh, it's actually a zero sized type um, just for fun so I don't know why on earth you'd want to do this <laughs> as this oh item list ends there oh okay don't embarrass me compiler I'm supposed to be the teacher <laughs> we're at the end of the process we get ta-da we've been able to implement we've been able to define a trait up the top define a new type implement the new trait the new type for the trait and construct a, val a, var a value of that, that new type and then call its method uh, which is a uh, this type that we've the, the trait that we've defined so does that how is that an explanation like uh oh there's a good question actually that i missed um uh, rust by example is a better Um do, do, do. is that explanation is that clear now? How about I ask that question? Tap pause, do you just scroll? Okay, good. Okay, with that I think I'm gonna wrap up my stream. <laughs> If you are a Rust user or like a, you've got a membership, please, uh, please subscribe um, to like click the follow button and you'll get an instant notification. And uh, if you would like to get a subscribe, like a notification when I go live, um, here is the Rustation Station Discord link and every rust streamer like every like is in that is in that discord and you're welcome to join you can also follow me on twitter and um and so forth and like i'm all over the socials <laughs> basically um doo -doo -doo -doo. trying to figure out which screen is best oh this one this would have been best <laughs> this is the one that I intended to have the whole time. Ah! Okay. Well, now that we've reached the end of the stream, I <laughs> I guess it's appropriate that I finish with um with the background that I kind of wanted to go for. But um it's been really enjoyable to have everyone um participating. I hope that you had a lot of fun and I uh am happy to repeat this session or this format. Um, if it's been really positive, kind of give me the, some feedback. Um, I look forward to hanging out. So I'll leave the stream running for anyone who wants to participate on the, the chat. Um, otherwise, I shall let you go. Thanks so much, and I'll see you again probably this time next week. <laughs>